guys, fly me to the moon. We are here at Bitcoin 72,000, unheard of, uncharted territory. We're here to talk about where we could possibly be going this week. Is this the part, is this uh, the sort of December 2020 revisited? Are we going to triple inside of two months or three months? Uh, anything's possible. Uh, I want to hear some bullish predictions here. I, I don't want people to talk about going back down to 50,000. That's not allowed. You will be kicked from the room immediately if you say something like that. Only number go up here. That's the only technology we admit. Derek, you're up. Derek Wall. Or anybody else who wants to speak? Anybody? But, uh, I'm just, speakers? I'm so bullish right now. I mean, we're not even at the having yet. And we've already made, you know, new all-time highs. Um, I think people don't realize how much money and capital is still going to flow into this space from countries, investors. Uh, people are just kind of clueless. Um I can't believe there's not more mainstream attention right now and my normie friends. just It's just a completely different feeling this time around than the past, like, couple, you know, cycles. Um, I'm always, I was afraid to say this time is different, but this really feels different this time. I yeah. totally agree, uh, Neil. This thing feels very different. And one of the things that feels different about it is we don't see the crypto uh, narrative, you know. It's it's really the crypto narrative is not there. You're you're not hearing the Solana bros and the ETH bros. At least right I'm not, you know. So uh, it feels like it feels very different to me. Uh, That's a good point. You know, I anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. I don't really Neil, follow, yeah. yeah, I don't really follow many of the crypto people, but you're right, the noise does it, it, there's you don't even hear anything really, from the crypto people. You know, we've had a lot of uh, people come over to Bitcoin with things that, you know, these layer twos that people are speculating on. Uh, but that's really besides the point. It's it's the ETFs that's kind of driving this right now. And, you know, we just got news the past couple of days or like scoops that the ETH, uh, the possibility of ETH ETFs being approved anytime soon is not likely. Uh, that's more bullish for Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I mean, everything right now is bullish for Bitcoin. I find, I can't find anything um, that's bearish right now, which kind of scares me. But I'm excited. I think we're going to absolutely teleport to 100K. And I have, I, I just can't see a scenario now where we don't hit that before the halving. Um, I, I, I feel very, very, very bullish. Hi guys! I gave Bitcoin Magazine a ninety thousand dollar prediction for the halving, and I feel low right now. Yeah, Fred, you. Uh, I tried to join yesterday's. Um, sorry, I'm having difficulties here. I we can hear you, Eric. We can hear you. Sorry, sorry. I tried to join yesterday's. Uh, I wanted to gamble with you guys, and I, I missed it. I was trying to get on to, to speak with you guys. But there uh, will but, be more opportunities, Derek. Yeah, there's, yeah. There, there's plenty of action coming. Don't you worry. I mean, I need, I need to make some. She's on any. I just don't know. We can we can play in your league. You're you're kind of in one of those kind of VIP uh, baccarat tables, you know, like in Monte Carlo, you know, where it's just James Bond against the croupier. We're not quite there yet. A uh, high limit spaces is, I think, what we what we need then. I, if you guys knew me, I'd live like a pleb completely. I don't really care about that kind of stuff, but I love gambling on on deals like this. But let me give you my take. So, I agree with everyone. I I I don't think I think past is gone with respect to any technicals. Um, I spent a lot of time reading last night on the worldwide news. You know. From Asia to Europe to Dubai to, I mean, it's it's coming. Um, I think it's going to literally, you know, rip the faces off. And, you know, I think 100,000 in the next probably, you know, two weeks um, is is probably likely. And I, and I wish I could have bet because I think by Christmas, if this continues the inflows, I don't think anyone's selling. Um, you know, I think we'll see three or 400,000. Everyone's yeah. jumping on. Um, and everyone realizes it's the scarcity aspect of it. And, and what's awesome is we have 40, 50,000 people 
uh, right now from BlackRock and all the ETFs are really educating the boomers like myself uh, with respect to the scarcity. And I and this stuff's going into 401ks, it's going into retirement funds, and I and and those won't be sold ever, right? So uh, I'll shut up, but uh, that's my take. Now, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I've heard some people say, oh, you know, human nature hasn't changed. We're still going still gonna to have boom and bust cycles. Yeah, for the average person, human nature hasn't changed. But the infrastructure uh, going into this bull market is completely different. And the nature behind how these big capital allocators invest is different than your average retail investor. It's completely different. And is it just me or does it feel very, very tame right now for an all time high? I mean, last cycle, it was so frothy at this point. And now, I mean, we're all talking about it and it's on CNBC, but it just, it, it feels very tame, which I also think is incredibly bullish. Like we haven't hit the FOMO stage and I don't even think we're close. I, uh, I wanted to maybe try and push back a little bit on, on one thing. Dan, what do you think? Oh, oh, Jack was talking. You couldn't hear him. For I wanted to, to mention. I couldn't that. hear him. Keep on going, guys. Jack, yeah, maybe go off the stage and come back. Oh, shit. Can you Fred. guys not hear me? Or is it Fred? I don't know. Fred can't hear yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Fred can't hear you. Yeah, yeah try you. going off the stage and coming back. Okay. Now yeah, I killed him. I've, I've never seen the all time high, you know, 17 and a half K. And. I know myself. I don't care about this. Um, I am extremely bullish for the coming uh, coming few years here, and I like to like, zoom out and kind of think about the first fifteen of, of Bitcoin's life. It feels like that was almost like Bitcoin as an adolescent, you know, coming through. A lot of people just kind of gave it a bad name and limelight, even though we kind of knew what it was. But with the ETFs here, with the guardrails in place, I feel like now is a time where it can't be ignored. And I feel like a three four hundred k price target this year is well within the realm of possibility. So, yeah, I'm bullish. I love hearing you guys say that. Uh, and and Derek, I, I love hearing your perspective, especially coming where you're where you're coming from. I was I was kind of the lone lone ranger at estimating four twenty k at the end of this year, and I, and I feel I'm I'm hugely convicted that that is very possible. I mean. Even reasonable, which is silly sounding, but when you look at the old cycles and you you kind of discount how shitty the last cycle was because of so much headwinds. I mean, just everything was attacking Bitcoin. It, you know, just just an average of the 2013 and 2017 run-ups would put us in probably beyond 420 for the cycle high, and it does it quickly after we do what we did today, breaking the uh, all-time high. So. I don't know. It just seems like the tailwinds and the amount of money needed to move this, I mean, 69 or $72,000 Bitcoin sounds expensive, but it's only because of our, our unit bias of being around for a while because we've, you know, it just feels expensive to, to make another purchase at this high rate. But in the market cap world, you know, what are, I don't know, what we're one and a half trillion or something. It, it's just, it's incredible that 30, I would say 30 trillion, let's see, what's, no, sorry, $18 billion, if that were to come in in the next month, we'd be at 100K, you know, and I'm kind of just using what the ETFs have done so far, and then projecting it forward, and it makes 100K by the having seem almost, I mean, a little bit low, like, I think 110K by the having makes more sense if we're just taking a cold, hard, mathematical view of, of what the ETFs have done so far. And it all kind of hinges on GBTC, you know, clamming up a little bit. But, man, it didn't, by the way, did you guys see Sailor? Um, he was like 13 minutes this morning, and he was just, he was killing it on the idea that Bitcoin's property and why would you, don't, don't get wrapped around the axle on currency and all those stupid FUD things that the normies come up with. It if you look at his property, it helps me explain it to my parents and other people so much better. And they and they let go of the government's going to kill you because you're competing with the dollar. Then they see it as like, oh yeah, the U.S. is we're sovereign. We respect we respect property here. I can hold property. Anyways, that's my my morning thoughts. Sailor is a fucking legend, and that 12 minutes on CNBC this morning is a must-watch. I mean, no, nobody leave this space. Enjoy this space. But after this space, go and watch right. that. It is phenomenal. He had his coffee today. Um, can you guys hear me now? I hear you, Jack. Yes. Yeah, cool. So I, I, I've been um, 
kind of thinking about the uh, somebody mentioned something about that you know institutions allocating it's kind of like you know that this time is different thing and and I've been a maxi for I would say uh, like ten years at this point but I've been thinking a lot about this which is that I see that when the price gets high enough start, that's when people start to really pay attention to sailor and get orange pilled and go all in and you know do crazy things and and this time around I'm expecting people like you know selling their house to go all in Bitcoin, selling their entire 401k to go all in. And um, I, I'm starting to think that maybe there's some kind of prophetic sort of thing to this power law, which is like we get up to the top in that range really, really fast. 250k, uh, you know, to 350k range is kind of where uh, it predicts a top for 2024. And and I'm thinking that, you know, that. that ETFs in the past have gone down um, 80, 90% before. The S&P is obviously at massive drawdown. So I'm actually in the camp that we will see another uh, bear market decline of maybe 70 plus percent after just absolutely ripping everybody's face. And then, you know, people get overexposed and then they panic and then they sell. And maybe that the, the true super cycle is in for another four, eight years. So I want to get um, some feedback on that thought. I love the idea of uh, getting getting there faster. I think that's an accurate idea. I think that 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 goes with kind of what happened in twenty twenty, right? Uh, I'm sorry, twenty twenty, yeah, twenty twenty, December twenty twenty. Like we just ripped super super fast, and then we got we got all the gains in the first couple months, and I think that may be where we go here. Thomas, yeah, Fred, I I think. <laughs> I mean, if you ask for a bullish prediction, I would say it's probably double from here uh, to the halving. So that is, so that's what, six weeks out, and I would just say 150. And and, and the reason I would say that is because is I think every week's going to be up. When you look at missed opportunities to buy, well, I'll just get it next week on the dip. You're like, oh, that ship sailed. I think we're just going to see this rotation of money. Into this, we're in the early phase of the institutional money coming in, and you know, in a bullish prediction. I would just say the 150 by the happening. Um, that's I, I think that's pretty bullish. I think it's it's possible. I was just surprised looking at the model that I have. We were up 43 percent for the month of February. We're probably going to be up 35, 40 percent for March, um, and then you're not far from getting to the 150 at that point. Yeah, and and I, I almost think that the true price discovery point is is past a hundred for for a lot of people who are only casually paying attention. You know, obviously we're we're all deeply involved in the space and know that it's just broken all time high and that is making headlines. But I think there's still a power in the psychological numbers that you know the, that kind of inflection point where I was talking about where it becomes a global mania doesn't even start until post 100k. Cutthroat. Let me throw something out there, and this is this is developing right now. We're only a couple weeks, or maybe a week into this trend, but the the trend. Uh, so so imagine the amount of people who are all putting their money in trying to buy Bitcoin. There's a huge percentage of that money that is old school. It's what we grew up with over the years we've been in this, and we're used to volatility and the traders and and all the all these like dollar like a ten thousand dollar bitcoin it, it did create like a, a a moment of of like you said a shelf a mental hurdle but as what what i think we may start seeing and maybe already have seen for a week is this consistent 300 million per day coming in on the weekdays that is just driving like a very steady rise and i think that when we get to different hurdles, call it a hundred thousand. We just saw it with the all time high. That's always a big mental hurdle, right? And it did bump up, but relative to the old days, I mean, we would have had a bigger crash as we felt, you know, as it, as it turned into uh, uh, resistance and it would have, it would have messed with the price more than it does. So I think the more that we add, uh, the more, uh, what's the word inertia that the heavier percentage of, ETF based funds that are now in the market, they're going to create this dampening force. So I'm curious to see what happens when we get to those points like 150K or 250K because 
in yesterday's uh, betting, you can see how <clears throat> a lot of people are expecting 150k as maybe the top, or or these different things, and they've been kind of popular among some of the uh, some of the circles I follow on Twitter. But it'll it'll be really telling to see if the ETF churns out day after day 700 million and just kind of blows through those. You know, the traders sell, but it just is like whatever. I'll drop three. I'll drop five thousand points or five thousand dollars per Bitcoin. But I will keep churning and buying, and I'll just move through 250k. I think that's going to happen, but we just don't know yet. I tend to think that something that supports that idea is also just the. The max pain scenario for the the people on the sidelines or people who are casually interested and it's like okay once it dips down like 30 percent 40 percent as it has in prior bull markets uh that's when i'll get in and then that just never happens it just dips like 10 percent a, a few times or maybe 15 and that's it yeah i mean we're, we're breaking these like we're still we're the volume just see i bit so far they're at two billion today um, and I know volume is not the same as inflow, but the popularity and, and if volume and inflow are going up together, it just seems so bullish for the trend we're on. We're, we're really, we're eating gold's lunch right now, if the gold's uh, ETF's lunch. And I don't know, what do they have, like 80 billion? Gold is, uh, you know, breaking all-time highs out of a, a massive, something like 10 plus year consolidation, despite that. Um, and so I, th there's a, there's another, there's somebody I follow who, who was saying that, um, there's this saying that gold always knows something and that perhaps is even more bullish for Bitcoin because gold knows that, um, you know, more QE is coming and more printing is coming. How long do we think until the Bitcoin ETFs eat the gold ETFs? What do we think here? And do we want to put some Satoshis on it? Uh, no, <laughs> I have issues at home if I start betting too much because I'm an addictive personality. But I think it, it won't be long. I mean, this year, draw it. 2024. Oh, well, I think we'll beat them. You know, like, well, it's like that balance. I think we're Friday. We took 127 million from they went down 127 million on their ETF and we went up. I don't know what it was, 200 and something million or maybe 300 million. It'll happen pretty quick. We've got a couple of hands raised. Uh, they're being polite and patient, so I'm going to try and call them out. Uh, the crypto BTC, I think he was first. Hey, yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Crystal clear. Okay. Hey, um, so uh, Fred, first of all, I want to say I've been following you for quite nice. some time. Thanks so much for uh, you know for everything you put out. I'm a huge numbers guy. Um, I work at an RIA. I specifically work in like private equity, uh, real estate, and I hear this, I, I, I've started hearing this more and more pretty often in the space, and that is that, you know, a lot of these investors, like qualified purchasers, we're talking 5 million plus net worth, are all, you know, a lot of them are starting to have like deal fatigue with a lot of like the real estate investments and stuff that, you know, they're getting into, and, you know, I, I'm trying to pitch it this way, you know, a lot of these investments you're getting in five to seven year uh, illiquid window. You know, you're not going to see that money for quite some time. And, and you know, I'm looking at the best way for me to pitch it myself because I've, I've orange-pilled myself. I've also orange-pilled my wife. You know, I've orange-pilled a lot of my own personal, like, circle. And we all understand, like, the value of this. And so I was thinking about it this way. You know, what, like, especially with how stuff is unfolding, why would you invest into real estate in a five to seven year, like, illiquid uh, time frame when that's essentially the same to almost the same time frame as two full Bitcoin cycles. Like if you can get in to one of these cycles now and you can look out six to eight years, like, don't you th like, I feel like people are going to slowly change their mindset towards that. And they're going to get into this space sooner than later. And then they're just going to have that same mindset and looking out six to eight years. And if you look two cycles out from now, you know, we're looking at 2032, I think we're going to be at a million plus by that point. And so, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really curious as to like, you know, with how you guys are saying everything, I think we're going to blow past six figures. Like that's, it's a no brainer for me, but I think the bigger psychological factor is what if we go to 300 K? What if we go to 400 K? But here's the bigger thing. What if the new bottom after we drop 30, 40% is six figures, that would essentially mean 
so many people, so many generations of people are going to be priced out. Like no one's going to get, no one's going to get the entry point that we've had for the past three, six months. And we're all just going to be the next generation of millionaires. That's how I see it. Well, I just would say that the, right now is a pretty good entry point right now. I mean, I don't know. I, I, a lot of people are asking me, you know, Absolutely. did I miss out on it? And I'm like, no, you did not miss out on it at all. What are you talking about? You know, you're at the same price it was in 2020, pretty much, right? You know, 10, you're, you're at 10% of 2020. We've got three years ahead of us. We have ETFs approved. You know, I, I don't know what else I can say other than it's cheap. Right, and when you look at the fact that you now have a consistent demand side to the equation, you know, for however long we want to look at this, we want to look at this a decade out, two decades out, the game has literally changed. And if you don't get in now, like, you know, once the train passes six figures or deeper into six figures, people aren't going to be able to get in. Like, they're just not going to want to, mainly because of the unit bias. But, I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just how I think about it. Uh, I think Justin has his hand up and then Ed afterwards. Yeah, Fred, I ex agree 100%. I mean, it hurts paying 70. When I loaded up at 35, I was 90%. At that point, I went 99%. What I have to tell myself when it hurts so bad to, to pay 70 is just step back and think about where we are. We're weeks ahead of the halving. We, we had an all-time high on a weekend. We're on the cusp of $75,000 right now, and maybe it's anecdotal. The sentiment I, I'm feeling, though, is that retail really has not woken up. So no retail, and um, no advisors, no retail, no corporates, no sovereign wealth funds, no – I mean, it's it, – we're at the very beginning, right? I mean, you just – no matter how you look at it, this ETF is in Act One. It's a you know, this is the first inning of the ball game. You know, to use the baseball analogy, right? This is this is the bottom of the first. You know what I mean? That's kind of where we are. Yeah, and, and I hate uh, to bring up shit coins, Fred, but you know, at this point, so many people should have quote unquote rotated into alts, and what we're seeing is that alts are rotating into Bitcoin, or you know, coming back. Especially, you know, I'm I'm hearing ETH too now. You know, some some of these ETH people are are having second thoughts. I mean, if I was Raul Paul and I had 100 percent of my net worth in ETH and Solana, I might be con reconsidering things right now. Ed, you're up. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, like I I I don't know if I agree with uh, the crypto. Crypto caca, I guess, uh, about people being priced out when once we reach six figures. I don't think people are going to be priced out in that sense because you know you can always buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. You can buy as pretty much as small of amount as you want. But I do think the ETFs are going to protect against a huge crash in the future. I think that's something a lot of people aren't really thinking about because so many of those ETF investors are investing in retirement funds and to, for other means. It's not just day traders, not just people who are holding forever, but it's people who are going to bear with the bear market and not going to panic because they're, it probably represents such a small portion of their portfolios, those people who have the ETF, that it's going to create more stability in my opinion. Not to mention, if you're priced out and uh, are sort of listening to stuff like this, there's uh, probably a generational wealth opportunity in shorting ETH to zero. Eventually, eventually, not now. Yeah, like, uh, personally, I don't, I don't see ETH going to zero. I, I know a lot of people have that opinion. I do think ETH is going to be there for the, in the long run. But personally, I prefer Bitcoin, and I've been in Bitcoin over ETH for quite some time now. Oiko, go for it. Thank you very much for having me on this space. Um, well, the first one thing I want to say about unit bias is I don't think there's a unit bias. I mean, it might sound odd, but we have 100 million Satoshi. I mean, essentially speaking, given the network and 
and the ability to pay fees, providing the fees aren't too much, you can still come away with buying a thousand sats, even if it's worth 10 million a coin. I was going to ask more about the uh, ETF. How is the ETF function? I mean, it functions independently of Bitcoin's chain, but I'm, I'm not a financial guy. I don't really know as much as you lot about finances. I haven't spent a decade in the business, so to speak. I was just wondering about how an ETF actually works with respect to Bitcoin. Because most of these ETFs are traded on, well, they're not on the chain, so to speak. And uh, especially if we talk about uh, algorithmic trading, especially with, when, with respect to it going on within the millisecond and making profits within the millisecond, there's no way about putting that kind of that kind of amount of transactions on Bitcoin. It's just basically impossible. But do you not think that there's a possibility we have a price differentiation, like a, a difference in price between what Bitcoin ultimately is? And what the ETF would short, an, short answer is no. It's it's a it's a complicated subject, and you can you can go and read. There's a lot of good stuff that I reference on my Twitter and on my YouTube. But uh, it short answer is no. You don't have to worry about it. Um, let's go to uh, British. Well, well, well. We are almost at seventy three thousand. It's not bad. Yay! It's not bad, huh? This is, uh, I just finished the podcast with CJ and, you know, I'm actually pretty impressed by what's going on here. I don't know about anyone else. I, I, I'm struggling to find words of what to say, considering, as you were pointing out, we don't have RIAs yet. We don't have income funds yet. They haven't even started selling this thing. We haven't got every asset manager in. I mean, Charles Schwab isn't even in on the game yet, right? 1% from Charles Schwab is another $80 billion. You got 8.95, 8.5 to $9 trillion sitting on the sidelines of the market. That's realized it's been completely fucked over the last year and a half, waiting for this doom and, groom, doom and gloom boomer crash that everyone was talking about that hasn't come. Like, that's going to need some, some returns that needs to catch up on. Where do we go from here? I don't know. We could be ramping up to half a billion dollars a day net coming into this. Yeah, we're going straight up for here, from here, and that's why I think that the cycle is completely destroyed. I mean, with all of this institutional money coming every single day and all of the, all, all of the other piles of money that you all just mentioned, sovereign wealth funds, we don't even have any major corporations other than micro strategies and a little bit at Tesla and a little bit at Cash App holding Bitcoin on their balance sheets. I mean, we are so early, and that's how I think you know, the, the cycle is destroyed. It's straight up from here. Yeah, I have a question for somebody. I'm sure somebody here could answer this, which is, what's the ratio of BTC that gets purchased on average by the ETFs per dollar inflow? So if I wanted to buy 72K worth of an ETF, uh, are they buying, they're not buying a whole Bitcoin, right? They're buying a percentage. Well, if you put in $72,000, their job is to go and buy $72,000 worth of Bitcoin. I, I, I had heard somewhere that it's not quite like that, that it, it's a little more complicated under the hood and that um, the net is not quite one to one. But I'm not sure. That's why I wanted to ask. I mean, I was under the impression it's one to one minus yeah. whatever their fee is. It's a one to one yeah. cash create. Yeah, that's legally it's supposed so to be one to one. They go through the APs, though, so it's, it's not instant. It's not it's not like it's taking place as soon as somebody buys the ETF or sells the ETF. It's. A little more complicated than that because the active participants usually hold it already. So it's not affecting the market instantly like a lot of people think it is. Okay, interesting. So even more bullish. I feel like... Uh... The, the way you described it, British hodl, just kind of lack of words for what's going on. It's sort of, I reflect that 100%. I mean, I, when I see, um, was it, it might have been you, Fred, who mentioned today on Twitter something about um, Bukele meeting um, some overseas nations, you know, the handshake and, and stuff. And, and I, I think any mention of like the petrodollar or what that, 
what that person represents in terms of doing trade on such a big level, potentially for oil, but it can be for anything from that whole that whole side of the world I have nothing, no familiarity with. I just know they have a lot of money. And and I think I even heard that Bitcoin in religious circles is, the word might have been halal, something to say that Bitcoin as a money is religiously approved over... Um, I think in Muslim religions, but you know, there's all these things that are all floating around that makes me think they're maybe getting a lot of traction uh, in other parts of the world that that may even. You well, know. I guarantee you, as as British Hoddle said, I guarantee you that this uh, Middle Eastern guy—I don't know—I think he was from Qatar, but I could be wrong or UAE. I'm not sure, right? But that guy did not go to see Bukele because he wanted to uh, do a honeymoon in uh, El Salvador, okay, in order to buy, <laughs> or to buy coffee, right? <laughs> That's not why he was there. You know, but, I mean, El Salvador is certainly a nice place, good beaches and so on, but, like, that's not, <laughs> that's not the interest of this guy. So, and it's not why Bukele leaked it on Twitter. And so I, and I put a kind of a, kind of a tongue-in-cheek. I was like, hey, how's the wife? Uh, hey, are the kids good? Uh, great. Uh, what uh, what do you think for the next uh, you know the next uh, three hundred thousand coins that I'm going to buy? You think a ledger or a treasure or multi sig? What do you what are you what are you feeling? You know? <laughs> and I, I'm sure that was the discussion that they had. You know, Dude. yeah, one hundred percent. I I, don't, I bet um, Bukele and I mean these guys are going to get up to speed very quick now. I feel like you know people say it's early, but it may not be that early in terms of time. Right? It may be early in terms of price, but in terms of time, people tend to get educated really quick when they sense that something is, uh, you know, really brewing. It, it incentives drive effort, right? So at the end of the day, the Middle Eastern nations are realizing that the world is trying to move off of oil, right? They're, le- that they're realizing that if oil goes up anymore, Texas has the biggest oil repository in the world, and they need to figure out a way to, to stay relevant and allow, allow them to transition. And what better way to do that than to put a percentage of daily oil sales into Bitcoin? I mean, Edward Snowden made the call that this year we're going to find out that a nation state was buying Bitcoin in secret. And I think when that comes out, I mean, the price, I think, doubles overnight when that comes out. Dude. Yes. De- depends on the nation state. But, you know, if it's UAE. Yeah, fair, fair point. Yeah. If it's UAE, I think it doubles. To, to, to me, it's a national security threat if you're not if you're a nation and you're not buying Bitcoin because it's going to allow other nations to catch up if it does succeed in the long run, and you're going to be left in the dust. So I I think most governments, if they're not high, if they're not super focused on trying to figure out if they should be buying it now, they're going to be very soon. I got a question for. For Derek and Fred and any other entrepreneurs out there, um, so this morning, Sailor was on TV. I don't remember if he mentioned it by turn, but I saw a tweet showing that Sailor has orchestrated the $820 million, I I don't know if it's a convertible note or whatever it is, but he got the money and he got it at 0.69% interest. And the, the little quip I read was, Sailor gets 0.69% interest, and he's made 5% in two days. And, and my my mind went to, oh my god! Like if I'm a if I'm a company, public or otherwise, and I see that kind of, we all know we can get cheap money, not not that cheap, but holy shit! I mean, why wouldn't you put a bunch of your treasury in? And and I'm wondering if you guys who've had you've, you've had large treasuries, I assume, with Buy.com and the companies you've had, Fred. Did, does that seem like Worth the hassle when you're a big dog and you, like you got to go learn about this, or would you do well, I'll it? I tell you right now, it's a lot easier than it was when Michael Saylor did it, right? Because when yeah. Michael Saylor did it, he had to kind of work out his custody deal with you know like a couple people, including Coinbase, right? But like right now, if you want to do it, it's very simple. You already own a bunch of stocks in your treasury. You can just pick your favorite uh, Bitcoin ETF. That's it. It's like takes five minutes. You know what I mean? So it's not hard. You don't have to do all this research. You don't have to have like, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, terms of service and everything, and long legal agreements with the custodian. It's it's it just became really simple. So I do think other people will do it. Yeah. 
And now that it's a security, as a public company, is there anything, and, and the FASB rules, I, I, I can't tell if they're changing in 2025 or if you can take advantage of it during this fiscal year, but it, like... Well, it just seems like not just not just the idea of putting 10% of your treasury into some ETFs, but if it's easy and a company like Amazon, any of these fan companies, that's just kind of like a, almost like the UAE thing. Like that's an announcement that could have a 10K effect on Bitcoin. I mean, because when Elon announced he was doing something. Look, it, you you Bitcoin, know that's coming, right? We mm -hmm. There's just no possibility in this year that this is not coming. I, I I just, I don't, I don't, I don't I just like betting against that is just insane to me. I like, it's for sure coming. It's for sure there's going to be somebody, you know, this whole narrative of around Sailor and Bukele and that was, that was three years ago narrative. Let's go into the new narrative, right? We, we got to move to the new narrative. Gary, you got your hand up. Yeah, I think the new narrative, I mean, we're going through this exercise right now. By the way, great job, guys, on Friday or Saturday. Everybody picked these numbers for today. I, I thought it was a really tight, tight band of numbers. It'll be interesting how it settles. But, uh, you know, when we're talking about the UAE, like they can start buying the ETF immediately. Like, I, what, what's the allocation? Does anybody know what the allocation to U.S. ETFs are currently? It's got to be a colossal number, right? I oh, mean, these guys have. It's got to be colossal. They have these colossal. ETFs. They're going to pull oh, these the ETFs are seven to... trillion dollars. They and anybody can own them. And by the way, it's not like you know the. It's very easy to figure out who owns these things, right? Like it's not like even BlackRock has like a registry of like oh the UAE owns X. You know, not necessarily. You know, they're just like stocks. They're just like stocks. It's it's it's, it's pretty. It's pretty opaque. And I think it's going to be really interesting once we get the first quarter and we get to see people have to report on owning this to see who's bought these ETFs. I think that's going to be really telling. Gary's looking for the bet. Dallas, uh, you requested a speaker. What, what's up? How's it going? Dallas? I don't hear Dallas. I don't hear Dallas either. Uh, I just I just rejoined. Uh, can you guys hear me? Now we can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I don't know if you guys called on me, but uh, couldn't hear you guys the last couple of seconds. But yeah, what a day, Fred. Huh? Um, I was listening to a pod that uh, Eric Weiss did over the most recent conference, and he was talking about how a lot of the biggest funds as part of their mandate can never be more than 5% of the daily volume of, you know, uh, of something like a Bitcoin ETF Fred. So I was curious, like how you think some of these like really big players, like operating, overseeing, a, you know, big, big pools of capital are thinking about, you know, like when it makes sense for them to kind of scale up or do they just do so gradually as the size of these ETFs gain in size? I'm just curious if you'd give any thoughts to that, you or anybody. Well, all I, only thing I can say is they have this, uh, they have this saying, you know, is analyze and paralyze, right? You can analyze forever, but you get paral you get paralysis, or you can get FOMO'd into something. And, you know, it's kind of like that scene in that, uh, in that movie Margin Call, you know, when the guy's, like, okay, getting around a table, and they're like, okay, guys, how bad are we down? You know, I think, I think this could be, this could be like, okay, guys, why aren't we long any Bitcoin? What the hell is going on? You know, and you get the uh, <laughs> you get the Demi Moore kind of woman go, yeah, I'm sorry, but we've been studying it for three months and we didn't pull the trigger. And then you know, and then, <laughs> then you get the Jeremy Iron guys go, buy it all, you know. And I think that's kind of what we're what we're going to be looking at here is we're going to be at changing kind of the priority of kind of these quote unquote analyses of of this thing. And we're going we're gonna to accelerate it. That's what I think. I think you said it earlier, but I, it's the first time I've heard this, but I couldn't agree more. It's like it's, it, it, it may be early on price, but it's not early on time. And I think this is just going to start going quicker and quicker and quicker. And 
interesting. Some of my uh, retail, some of the old shit coins I had in my old days, um, I've got dust in them, so I watch them. But but a typical retail move is that unit bias move to Litecoin, and that thing's ripping. Litecoin and XRP are ripping today, and it makes me wonder if some retail aren't in the market or aren't starting to get into their Coinbase accounts. And, you know, maybe it's the first few quakes of them showing up. Uh, making the same mistakes. Um, we'll see. But I also wonder, you know, like today's price, uh, I, I think the market's open and Bitcoin had already gotten up to about 72K. And, I, you know, we've only risen like 500 bucks. Um, so I'm wondering if it's either a lot of GBT selling, uh, kind of offsetting the inflow, or if there's a, a good amount of retail pivoting out of Bitcoin and moving to some wild bullshit. I don't think so, because here's the thing. I think right now we're looking at two completely separate and disjointed markets. On one hand, you have the market on for ETFs, which is you know 80% of the dollar volume of the action, right? Which mm -hmm. is now which is now Wall Street, right? Pretty much buying for their clients, you know, through 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 some managed accounts, but mainly a lot of retail Wall Street investors, right? That's that's one group. Then you have another group, which is all the DHMs from 2017, right? So, so you got you got two completely separate groups. They just don't talk to each other. Yeah, it's interesting. Something else that's interesting. I mean, uh, Hodl15 Capital, I think is his X name. He does a great job of tracking the ETFs. And one thing that he posts about that I really find interesting is the amount of small Bitcoin holders that are selling into these ETFs. So he measures people who have 0 to 1 Bitcoin, 1 to 10 Bitcoin, 10 to 100 Bitcoin, and 100 plus Bitcoin and what they're doing. And everybody with 10 Bitcoin and less is selling right now, which I just think is insane. Like who's, who's selling their Bitcoin right now? I agree. I can't. Yeah, I, can't I think make actually that, that makes perfect sense, guys. It, it's always the small players, right? They're like my sister, seventy-five years old. She uh, really wanted to dump the whole position once she got in the money, right? Like it's just, hey, I got to get out of this trade. As soon as it got in the money, I called her up and I said, "Look, in your IRA, how much Altria?" And other paper stocks do you own? This was literally two days ago. And she said, well, I've got, a, you know, three times the amount that I invested in Bitcoin. I said, I want you to sell all of it to this morning, this morning and move it over to the Fidelity BTC account. She's like, why didn't you tell me that, you know, eight months ago? I'm like, eight months ago, you were underwater 30%. That, that pitch would have gone horrible, right? You would have you thought I was crazy. Hey, Diane, you've been, you've been you know, down 30 40 percent for the for the year we bought at the wrong time that was that's true our timing was off uh but now that she's in the money you know she's moving all the altria stuff all the poison stocks of 100 years ago and she's moving into bitcoin i think you're going to see a really powerful rotation from old stocks and these people that are amateurs in the space not professional investors this is what they do, guys. They get flushed out, um, sadly, but that's what they do. So to me, this is extremely normal that the big money is taking percentages away of what they're going to own uh, from, the, from the small money and the weak hands and people that have to buy something or think they have to buy something. Normal I'll tell you one thing, Gary, is the, the guys who are selling right now will never buy again. That's it. I agree. They, they, I just agree have their, they had their one shot, and they're never buying it. I agree. I also think there's a bunch of people who FOMO'd in at the top of last cycle, you know, 50, 50K plus, 60K plus, who didn't spend a second learning about it for the last few years and has just been waiting to get in the black, and now they're selling. Yeah, well, the guys that are selling are the people with weak conviction, right? Like, if you had the kind of conviction that some people in this room have, you would do a lot of things before you'd sell your Bitcoin. And it's just a lack of study. Lettuce hands, as they say. Yeah. It's sad to watch. You know, I, I, I agree, and I actually think it's worse than that. I think the fiat systems that we live in has forced people to not believe in themselves anymore and their futures anymore. 
And so when you get to that point, you start selling the hardest asset you've ever found because you have no faith about what's going to go, what ha what's going to happen in your future anymore. You, you have to believe in what you can create and what your what the meaning of your life is in order to hold assets and go through pain periods like this. It's extremely necessary to have faith in yourself. I mean, taking yeah. profits is a fiat well, look, mindset. The, I would say even more philosophically British, look. What we have, what we are, what we've sort of evolved into, especially in China, right, is sort of like this very kind of 1984 scenario, you know, where the government is telling you everything, you know, buy this, do this, uh, we're going to take your money, you have no power, you are just a number, you know, and and so yeah, so I do agree. I think our society is just it's gotten very dis, it's it's very dis. Uh, uh, what's the word dystopic dystopia uh, it's just crazy ignorant. and so ignorant yeah yeah and I hope they I hope we learn but it's becoming more obvious to your to, to your point um, but I think Biden just released like some kind of budget for you know seven trillion I think it was for next year and so they're not even trying to shore up a, a deficit type situation which is huge for assets and especially bitcoin but you couldn't advertise bitcoin more to the masses by things like what sailor did with his interest he, he literally is attacking the dollar and what biden's doing and continuing to do with the the congressional whatever office of the budget we're just we're just on this path to debasing and we got you know get used to it and so that I have kids, and I, I found it getting to me at times when I'm trying to recommend this really expensive college stuff and be like, is it worth it? Bare the answer is barely, you know? And so if we just have money to save in, it, everything else gets cheaper. And so it, as long as this hope catches on, I think people will understand, we can start being hopeful for our hard-earned sweat that we put into whatever job we're doing. We can actually save it, and the savings will start working for us just like the American dream or any dream, you need that kind of sovereign prop. You know, the, the thing about it is, is you, you know, if you've been around a little bit longer in life, like Gary and myself, you know, you, you realize people have been talking about these deficits for ages, right? I mean, even in the 80s, you know, or, you know the, there was a, a great book written by the actual the founders of Blackstone, right? Uh, Pete Peterson, right? One of the founders of Blackstone who, you know, birthed Black Rock, right? And, you know, basically this book said, listen, we're completely unsustainable. And here we are, you know, 40 years later, and it's you know, way worse, way worse than it was when he wrote that book in, like, 86. And, uh, and the, re the reason it's way worse is we've just been bleeding, like, you know, we've been bleeding 7% a year for the last 40 years. <laughs> so it's, it's compounded to, like, 10x. Uh, you know, that's kind of where we are. And uh, I don't know. I, I do think that it's, it's, it's headed for a crash, ultimately. I don't think in the next, you know, in the next five years, in the next, I think in the next five years, Bitcoin is just going to, is going to be that everybody who doesn't have Bitcoin is just going to be like sitting there going, how did I miss this? Fred, when you say crash, you mean sort of a, like a, a burst upwards, yeah? Or do you mean like? Oh well, yeah, I mean crash? when I say crash, I mean I mean I mean something like uh, you know Botswana or something, you know, like uh, you know they, the the problem is we're just printing too much money, right? We, we you can't you know and and Biden's now, I mean Biden's really terrible at it, right? It's very clear, but I mean it's just awful, right? He's just, but you know, we don't know how Trump's going to solve this. I think Trump's going to solve this by lowering interest rates to zero, which will solve the thing you know, for a couple, for five years, maybe, you know, it'll buy you some more time because right now with these high interest rates, I mean, the problem is completely obvious, right? It's like you cannot have $34 trillion in debt and 5% interest rates. That's just not, this is not going to work mathematically. Now, if you lower interest rates to zero, it's going to start looking better, but still a time bomb. It'll blow up. Thanks yeah, but Looking back for it, like like the analogy you gave, you know, for people like Gary and yourself, where people were screaming at, you know, deficits prior and it being this impending doom, there just really wasn't an option for most people most of the time to kind of get away from that, right? Like, like I think real estate was sort of an escape from that for some people, and obviously that's why you see 
you know, all the leverage that went into real estate allowed, you know, the good real estate to really, you know, outpace at the bare, you know, at the bare minimum, like hold par with the debasement that was going on. But, you know, you couldn't run the gold, you know, sure you could run to like some big socks of, you know, some of the biggest companies, but like people didn't really have that option to run to. But also, look, it's also a political will thing, right? Look, Reagan, you know, who I thought was like probably the best president we've ever had, you know, said, um, you know, he said, listen, I want a balanced budget uh, agreement, a balanced budget amendment, and I want to have line item veto, right? And nobody, they didn't give it to him, right? So people were like, no, nah, we don't want to actually balance the budget. And so, you know, he fought for it. He didn't get it. And, um, you know, and nobody really has, you'll, you'll notice neither politician is talking about balancing budgets now. Just they don't care. Yeah, yeah, I think that's how we know this thing is going to completely unwind. I mean, what happened to fiscal conservatism? I mean, now it's both parties doing it. When you think of a thirty-four trillion dollars, I mean, that's not even real to most people. So that going to fifty trillion, a hundred trillion, five hundred trillion—it's it's literally not real any, anymore to people. Well, that's why. That's why it's like an options. Like it's a multifaceted equation where it's like, what are people's options outside of that system? That's one part of it. Another part is. Uh, you know, what is people's confidence within that system to just kind of, you know, like charge ahead forward and just deal with it. And, you know, and then the other side is just math. Um, and like, you know, you look at 365 days ago, I think total public outstanding debt, not that it's all, you know, debt is the only variable in the equation, but like debt was, I think total for the U S 31.46 trillion. Now it's 34.46, right? So we're at 3 trillion in 365 days. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, sure, I could see Trump or whoever it is coming in and lowering interest rates. But, you know, again, it just kind of kicks the can down the road. And I agree, like, it could get way worse before there's like any sort of like collapse. Like, I think a lot of Bitcoiners have this like super short term window as if somehow all of a sudden it all just unravels. And then the U.S. is like Venezuela. And that's just very much not the case, <laughs> if you think that. Um, but, you know, the debt GDP can just get, get so much worse. And there can be, you know, a lot more inflation that happens in society before things get really really bad uh and in that time yeah i just you know there's gonna be some point where you can't the interest rates can't stay that low and they're gonna need to stay higher and that's just gonna be kind of a new normal i mean like the interest rates are really high in colombia and then in argentina but that doesn't mean it, it doesn't have the same effect as high interest right. rates. Larry, larry lapard larry lapard I, I hung out with in dubai he's a great guy right and uh, i i hang I hung out with larry and larry had put out this thing about this checklist checklist Gold, all-time high, check. You know, Bitcoin, all-time high, check. You know, and this is like a checklist for currency debasement, right? And, like, literally, we're going through the checklist. It's pretty clear what, what's going to happen next, you know. What's going to happen next is the dollar is not going to be worth the, the paper it's written on, right? That, that's it, right? Um, and it's more of a problem for assets than it is for inflation, right? Because wages will go up. So, you know, wages are going to go up. So if you're just kind of living hand to mouth, it's fine. Wages are going to go up. But assets, you better have hard assets because if you have the wrong kind of assets, uh, your, your assets are going to be worth nothing. And that's why we're completely screwed is because, you know, 90% of people live paycheck to paycheck. They don't own any hard assets whatsoever. So when this plays out, it's going to be disastrous for most people. So, I mean, we're celebrating today. We're bullish today. All-time high space. So we're going to keep it positive. But, like, this winning for all of us and Bitcoin going to 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, it's at all likely not going to be good for the vast majority of people out there. Look, it, it, look that's why I keep on telling people, like, and I, I've, I've shared this with British, too. Which is, you know, listen, it's not like Bitcoin's going to make solve all the world's problems. You know, it's going to solve, it's going to solve, it's going to make some people very rich. You know, you get in early, wow, you, you have an opportunity that, you know, 99% of the people don't have, you know. You're lucky to start a company and sell it, you know, great. The chance of that is, you know, no, most people, the chance of them doing it is 1%, right? Uh you know, this is an opportunity to really make money. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I, I just think this is, you know, this is more like the Titanic sinking and you have 21 million lifeboats. That's kind of, that's kind of the analogy that I use. Grab a lifeboat. Titanic's still going down. You know, whether you get your lifeboat or not, Titanic's going down. Well, you know, I would just extrapolate his point one, one step further is, Bitcoin makes it like the opposite of what happens to the little guy because I, I want to give the little guy hope and I don't know how to other than 
you know, the, the government debases the bit currency, your wages catch up a year later, the government debases the currency next year, your wages catch up the next year. There's always that delay that hurts the little guy. And I think Bitcoin, you know, they don't have any savings. I'm talking about the real little guy, real little guy. They don't have any savings, but they can, like, start maybe accepting their money and put it straight into, like, one more strike or cash app, one of those apps that automatically puts it into sats. Um, and use lightning so it's not such a big transaction. There, there's hopefully going to be a way to help the little guy capture that, you know, turn around that, that uh, whatever it is, debasement. Because that's, that's harder on them than anybody realizes. They lose like 20% per year in some, some you know, nations, right? So It's subjugation. That's what it is. The entire yeah. fiat system subjugates everyone unless you bend the knee and start playing by the rules of the system. And that's what Bitcoin yeah. allows somebody to fight against. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's shocking that it hurts. You know, I like that. There's so, yeah. It's like medieval ages, right? Yes. You, you have to kind of bow down to the Lord and then, you know, and you buy, you buy, you buy stuff from the Lord. That's kind of the fiat system. Right. And then you go to property and you make a lot of money, but then they tax the property. Like property taxes are so through the roof. It's like, damn it, they get you everywhere. But, you know, I feel like I'm rich on paper because my property's going up. But anyways, you know, to, to take this back towards the bullish thing, I, I hope nobody's got their hand raised. Oh, sorry, Thomas. I'll be quick. But last week, the summary from the Rational Root, who he's a great follow. I bet everybody here follows at the Rational, the rational Root. But his, his data from last week showed that the net inflows were 448 million uh, per day. Did I get that right? Yeah, 448 million per day uh, net. So, you know, taking into account that heavy GPT selling, that was like 780 million or something like that. Um, anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I think last week showed a ramp up and hopefully this week does too. Fly me to the moon. Well, one of the things I would encourage people to do is pay attention. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, I don't know if you can, can you hear me, Fred? Yeah. Thomas is talking. Can you hear me, Fred? I don't know if you can hear me. No, I don't think you can, Thomas. You might have to rejoin me. I'm, I'll, I'll just jump off and rejoin. <laughs> oh, sorry, Thomas. But, uh, hey, British, to your point, uh, I was telling my wife about to get to one Bitcoin meme that you have. Uh, because it's been a long road, but she, she bought one during the two days in the last cycle that it was above 60K. <laughs> so, you know, now we're seeing it at 72K and it's like, man, really, the little guy can't, you can't buy a whole Bitcoin right now. You're going to have to come up with like a get to a 10 million sats meme at some point. Yeah, it's either I'm going to have to adjust it down or just disappear, one or the other. There's no other way. I uh, don't disappear. Or, or radically change your life and start producing enough and play catch up very, very quickly. But that takes a lot of conviction. You, we got to produce more. If we're not producing, man, we're going to be the last guy in the chain getting a ticket. It's just we have gotten lazy as a nation, guys. So lazy. Can you hear me now? This is. Yep, we can hear you. So, uh, uh, Fred, a couple of talks ago, you you mentioned this. We should look at the appreciation of Bitcoin in constant dollars, and I think we're we have a very bullish case uh, uh, of appreciation of Bitcoin in constant dollars. But throughout the course of this year, we will see uh, the continuation of on top of the constant dollar appreciation. Appreciation as a result of a growing loss of confidence in the fiat currency holding its value. So I would encourage people to watch the Treasury and get a sense of of what's happening. It, it, the U.S. dollar is so uh, pervasive in world economy. It's not just uh, the petrodollar in world trade. It's that uh, country to country debt is often denominated in dollars. So if uh, uh, Belgium b borrows money in Poland, they do it in the dollar-denominated contract. So it takes a long time to unwind those positions. So uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but there will be a slowing um, 
loss of confidence in the dollar, that will, on top of the constant dollar appreciation, start to exacerbate these price targets that we're forecasting. And really, the Fed has really, in the, in the government, to the extent that they're the same thing, they have no choice. They, they, there's about $7 trillion of debt that's rolling over, plus an additional three of new debt that they'll have to put on probably this year. Uh, the coupon on that seven is probably 2% or under. If they don't lower the interest rates, the coupon's going to go up to 45 or more percent. And you may have situations where the Fed's going to have to be the buyer of last resort. So I, I, I would encourage people to pay attention to the Treasury auctions because it will be an indication as to whether or not we will get a goose in the price appreciation on top of constant dollar appreciation uh, for uh, where we think this Bitcoin price is going to go out through the year. I mean, there's a lot of smart guys in here who probably know a lot more about this than I do, but I've heard people say, and I'm curious what this group thinks, that stable coins is actually going to be a lifeline for the U.S. dollar. And the demand for stable coins globally is actually going to keep the dollar afloat longer uh, because they're just so wanted. Well, and then that, that leads right into CBDC, the CBDC narrative. I mean, that's yeah, but- like... Would you go to I mean, South yeah, America, for, Africa, you know, USDC ahead, and USDT? I mean, that's what that's what the people want. They're not asking for Bitcoin in those countries, and I think that that's just also going to accelerate. Um, yeah, I mean, where Bitcoin goes, the stable coins follow. Um, it's a peaceful way of being able to dollarize countries without having to get that agreed upon at the government to government level, and there's just going to be an acceleration. And then, obviously, every stable coin that that exists at least for usdc and seems like with usdt right there's a dollar holding uh that same equivalent value in in t-bills and so yeah it like fits the u.s interest if you can get more and more of these bank deposits converted into consistent reoccurring treasury buyers so it, yeah just it feels like that's the natural flow of things and they may they may fumble it who knows but uh yeah curious if you guys have any doubts Straw, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just uh, I had a comment and a question. Uh, so, in, in regards to the that video of Bukele uh, meeting with that with that official uh, from the Middle East, that was actually um, the the uh, UAE non uh, the UAE non resident uh, ambassador to El Salvador. So he's he's the he's the the resident ambassador from the UAE in Mexico, and then he kind of covers uh, Belize, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Um, so I'm not sure how much that ha- that would the, the 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 an ambassador would have to do with anything related to Bitcoin, um, but I was just kind of wondering what um, what thoughts are in terms of like what are what are what are, what would be the what are the signs of these of nation state adoption from the Middle East like what what would that look like what what's um, would they be buying ETFs would they would they be holding their own BTC and what's is there anything that's that's um, that's similar. That's comparable. That's um, that any like kind of previous asset that's been adopted by uh, uh, by these Gulf states um, that that can be kind of used as a case study for BTC adoption. Well, their their form of currency is oil a lot in the hit in the past. So the petrodollar developed, and I think there's a very strong case to be made that they're mining heavily over there, which means they're going to be a default, a de facto holder of Bitcoin. And the more that happens and the more they're connected with BRICS, I, I hope that it turns into something more like national trade as uh, among those countries. But other than that, it's out of my wheelhouse. I'll, I'll stop there. Macro, got your hand raised? Yeah, what's going on, guys? Well, I don't have anything to add to the um, Middle East buying, but wanted to talk about something that y'all were speaking on a little bit ago. And um, Gary had posted something earlier about the average net worth of people. And um, I think a lot of people just really overestimate the median net worth that most people have. And 
I think people are pretty much already priced out of being whole coiners if they're starting from zero and you're kind of at the the median for the U.S. at this point. Um, it's probably not likely that you're going to be able to get to, to whole coiner status. And that doesn't mean that Bitcoin's not valuable um, and, and you can't, you know, preserve your purchasing power using it and things of that nature. I think it's just not really appreciated a lot of the time when I hear people talking, it, generally speaking, it is high net worth individuals that are coming up on, on stages and speaking or they're dealing with high net worth individuals because they're, you know, Wall Street and stuff like that. But uh, I think you're pretty much already priced out of being a whole coiner at this point. If you're your average, you know, median blue collar person in the U.S., I, I just don't see how that person is going to be able to get a meaningful position, at least in perhaps last cycle uh, terms. If if you're trying to hit the American HODL 6.15 Bitcoin, I, I think that it's probably that ship has sailed at this point. I mean, yeah, six is definitely sailed for the average blue collar worker. But eventually, though, as this just grows, I mean, they're going to get exposure to it. It's going to get folded into pensions eventually and then 401ks. And, you know, that's not how we would all technically probably want to buy it, but they're going to get exposure to it eventually. I agree. And, you know, like I said, I think there's there's a difference between getting exposure, using it to preserve purchasing power and, and getting a meaningful stack. And meaningful is obviously completely dependent on the individual. But I feel like people are still talk almost like uh, people are going to be able to get stacks that are multiple coins at this point. And, and it just the median person coming in just does not have that amount of disposable capital to to add to their stack with or to start stacking with it's it's just an interesting dichotomy that i see on on x especially because i think a lot of people um listening hear people talk about you know having large stacks or trying to get a large amount and you know most people do not have very much income or assets or anything to be able to to put into this and so i don't know i know retail interest gets talked about a lot but it's just as far as order of magnitude goes right now i just i think order of magnitude with these institutions and stuff starting to come into the space retail is unfortunately just going to be less relevant so i don't know if like stuff like google search trends for bitcoin will still be as important i i guess it will be at least Maybe if we want to be looking at, you know, are we at euphoria yet or not? But um, I don't know. It just seems like people keep talking about retail not being here yet. But is that really that big of a pool of capital in comparison to, you know, like Qatar or somebody like that buying? It just I don't know that. It, unfortunately, I just don't think there's going to be that big of an opportunity for um, your average or your median person to be able to do all that much for themselves perhaps after um this cycle i do think that the the titanic is sinking to use fred's analogy earlier and i don't think there's that many lifeboats left for the median person i guess is what i'm getting at i mean there's two there's two sides of that there's like the the samson mao side where he's measuring in millions now and he wants to say like 0 0.08 mil but I think, you know, the other side of that is us measuring in Satoshis. And I think that that, you know, being a whole coiner, quote unquote, 10 years from now is not going to be anybody's goal, but it might be to have, you know, a million Satoshis, uh, which is much more reasonable. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Justin since he's had his hand up for a while. Yeah, I would just say if I was speaking to family and friends, uh, forget the 6.15 and just buy what you can because the value is still there. And if you're going to say it's the value is not there at 70,000, well, you're, you're betting against Michael Saylor who just took $800 million and said it is. So. Oh, no, I, I definitely think the value is still there. I guess I'm talking like um, orders of magnitude change in your purchasing power compared to your peers. I don't see that being on the table for much longer. If it still is, it's there, there's this interesting, I don't know. It's like, um, should you be buying Bitcoin? Yes. Will it be beneficial to you? Yes. Uh, am I a mega bull? Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to articulate like, you're not going to go a thousand X perhaps <laughs> again, I guess is what I'm getting to. So sometimes there's this, 
Yeah, about the difference in... I think we are going to go 1,000x. Hard- I mean, when we talked about nation-state adoption, <laughs> companies putting it on their balance sheet, it moving into pension funds, I mean, that that's 1,000x right there for sure. Yeah, and also the, the Bitcoin that's being bought right now is largely who's selling as people who finally got back into profit and maybe miners who have to stay liquid. And that's flowing to Wall Street. It's flowing to Black, BlackRock. That Bitcoin is never going to see the light of day again. And it's going to people like us with conviction who realistically, uh, you know, we may never sell or maybe we'll, we'll trade some at a million dollars. But Bitcoin is hardening every day. So, the, you know, at 70000 I would absolutely tell my friends and family to buy immediately whatever they can. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't want to discount that there's a, a, a risk reward ratio that's the best you've ever seen for a six x easy from here from seventy two k six x is very rational and all throughout time you know you used to expect a house to get two percent a year equity appreciation and that was standard or even good you know like we're kind of it depends on our hindsight bias if we're looking long range like assuming the stock market gives you ten percent is really all you could hope for when I was growing up. So now, if you're looking at a six x potential this year, and you know all these moonshots, that's a, that might as well be a, a unicorn. And that's that, that's what used to be only available to angel investing and stuff, you know. So the risk isn't even that great. So this, I, we don't want to let the recent bias of like, ah, I need a thousand x or a hundred x because I've got into Dogecoin. Those are the headline things. But serious money or people who are um, who have 401k money saved up through a lifetime of whatever job, those are all that money is becoming uh, accessible to get ETF uh, Bitcoin exposure. And like I think I shared on the other space, my wife's 401k, you know, right now it says you can only get MSTR and GBTC, but we're working on Bitcoin exposure. Hold, you know, so go buy master for now. But, you know, they're not, they haven't really opened the floodgates on that. And there's a lot of money there. And so I would just say that the little guy has, if, if they just pop their head out and realize a 2X is the best investment you should ever have. If you're a, if you're a 50 year old guy, a 2X is a killer investment. If you're looking at a year, if you're looking at four years, that's a killer investment. But Bitcoin's still got a lot more than that to run. So I would just yeah, counter with zero. With with zero risk, Ben. Zero risk. Yes. Hey, hey yes. this point on the on the uh, the small retail guy, and, and then Joe's got his hand up. Happy to have him in. Um, I think this is really now about us. Okay, we have to look around at our families now. We have an ETF. Like literally, I just found eighty grand sitting in one of my RAs, and it's sitting in bullshit. Okay, so like I think if people really start scrounging around. We, they will find more money than, than uh, they have. And one of those places is, and this is where I put the responsibility on us to start educating our friends and family. If you want to have this life-changing event, an opportunity to really grab it, because you're saying that someone cannot afford a $72,000 asset that we think has the ability to go at least 10 and maybe a thousand we're de- we're literally debating is it 10 or a thousand that nation states have not even bought yet people are going to have to sacrifice a little bit like maybe we need to educate our our family that a house investment is not an investment it's a house it's not really an asset that you would invest in and get great returns from um so you give me three bitcoin versus a three hundred thousand dollar house and like, I hope one of you guys going to go, Hey Gary, you know, you could go rent somewhere, take all that insurance, all the maintenance, all the bullshit you have to do with it and deploy 200 grand into Bitcoin. They just went from couldn't buy any Bitcoin to buying three and they have less weight around their neck. And the, the, the thing they're going to rent it's probably going to have the same kind of bed and the same kind of AC and the same kind of everything. So some of this is down to ego and real educational confusion on what people should be investing in. So I'm taking it upon myself to help everybody around me uh, really look at the economics. And we have so many charts we can compare against now. If we don't have to talk about wallets and you got to do it this way, dude, just get them in the program. 
then they can go down the wormhole. So that's my thoughts, Joe. Joe. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Sorry oh. about that. I was uh, hitting the button. It wasn't, wasn't unsticking. Um, okay. So I want everybody to sort of put these numbers in your head because they're key to understanding what the average quote unquote Joe has, right? If you take the median U.S. household, median U.S. household, they own little to no stocks outside of their 401ks and IRAs. Okay. Little to no. That's the median. Okay. However, among baby boomers, the median baby boomer's net worth is $215,000, $216,000. However, if you skew that number by the upper 10%, the upper 10%, the median, median of the top 10%, meaning the 90th percentile best, has a net worth of somewhere, by current estimates, between $1.8 and $1.9 million, right? So that's, that's your target demographic. This is why... The data overwhelmingly shows stock ownership is concentrated very much in the hands of the few. Now, if you go among that upper echelon, you're talking, first of all, again, let's just go to baby boomers in general. Baby boomers in general have about 30, about $78 trillion of investable assets, not including, not including their primary residence. Okay. Let's repeat that again. 75 trillion among the baby boomers, not including their primary residence. Now, if you go to stocks, okay, which is the easiest for them to transition into Bitcoin, among the upper echelon, that top 10%, somewhere between 22 and 23, obviously the market's been on a tear, so these numbers are a little bit out to like six months out of date. But, you know, let's just say conservatively, north of 20 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars of equities, okay, among just the top 10%. That's all we're talking about. Now, if you take those numbers, okay, and you were to just peel off, okay, um, from the top 10%, not your average Joe, which I think it was Macro was saying this, he's absolutely correct. Like the average Joe, you know, is not going to be able to go out there and buy Bitcoin. They're going to be able to BCA into Bitcoin. They're going to be able to get a small allocation. But that's, you know, that's no different than what they've been able to do with equities. And they haven't done that just because they're overburdened with debt and they don't have a lot of disposable income. So throw them out. If you're talking just the top 10%, if you're capturing between 5 to 10% of that market, of which is already in equities, okay, you're talking conservatively like three, this is just the United States, by the way, somewhere between three to $4 trillion of additional capital flowing into Bitcoin. Now, just go do the math, okay? Look at the actual money in Bitcoin. Everybody keeps pointing at the market cap of, you know, being in north of a trillion. Uh, as my friend Checkmate says, you know, that's a totally bogus number because that includes a ton of coins that were never actually purchased and you can't really uh, count them towards the real market cap because they're lost, they're out of circulation. The true market cap, the realized market cap, that's considerably lower. You're talking about $400 billion. That's probably closer to an actual market cap, um, somewhere in the range of Visa stock. Okay, nowhere near Apple, nowhere near Google, nowhere near NVIDIA, nowhere near any of these big juggernauts that you'd have to double the price effectively to get there. And that doesn't even account for, you know, the, the, the penetration, which is extremely anemic. But the, the study I was just looking at today showed among the boomer class, you're talking somewhere between three to four percent penetration. Um, among them, just have some allocation at this point. So you're leaving out another 97% of that class that has trillions of dollars of assets that can that can be easily uh, sold, very high levels to get a base allocation at Bitcoin. Nothing crazy, right? Nothing um, uh, that would, would would shock the conscious in terms of the allocation. Just something realistic because, hey, guess what? Everybody's getting in. So to me, like the pools of capital out there, you have to be very careful when you say retail, because I think there's trillions of dollars of retail that can easily find their way into the Bitcoin market cap without any quote unquote institutions, without even the companies, without even you know, uh, the, the, the more allocation among um, some of the pensions, without even the endowments. Like you've got huge pours, uh, uh, pools of retail capital. They could easily go out there and afford one, two, three, four Bitcoin. Um, among that top 10%. But, you know, Macro, whoever was talking, that, that their point is well taken that your average Joe, you know, he, he's going to have to be more um, realistic with what he can stack. Thanks. Hey, Joe, on that point, just give a little more depth. There are 62 millionaires in the world. If you do an assessment and they only allocate $25,000 to Bitcoin in any form whatsoever, one shot, no recurring. This is over their entire lifetime. That's one point five five trillion dollars. 
Okay, again, 62 million millionaires, they each deploy $25,000, okay? Cut in half, do whatever you want. That's 21 million Bitcoin at today's price, just to put a little number on it. Dallas. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's the problem uh, with hanging out all you with you, Legends, is I just keep getting more and more and more bullish. So, Sorry to speak over you, Dallas. Go no, ahead. no, you're you're good, man. I was gonna say, I mean, I, I'm as bullish as, as I think anybody anybody here, but I do think it's important. Like, I think earlier we somebody threw out like zero risk, and like I, Bitcoin doesn't have zero risk, right? It just has significantly lower risk than anything else that's out there, and it's out in the out in the out in the world in a very public way. And but it doesn't have zero risk. Um, well, let's let's define think, risk. What's your so the, I think half the time we talk past each other. So Dallas, Gary, why don't you each give your own views of risk? Because I think that the disconnect is you probably view something as risk or risky that Gary doesn't. Dallas. Yeah, no, that, it's fair, and, and I, I, I bet. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I mean, what what might be some of the risks of Bitcoin? Um, I think one is just humanity's like lack of understanding and you know, desire for comfort. I think that there's always, always, uh, you know, code level issues that can happen if there's upgrades, right? There is, you know, potential forks down the road and the unknowns of how that may play out. There is, uh, you know, a whole, a whole number of different things. I'm not saying these are like, you know, high risks, right? That, that would send Bitcoin to zero, but, um, you know, I mean, the, but there's, it's not without risk, right? I mean, would you guys disagree with that or would you say that there's, Zero well, well, do you, do, Dallas, do you think, put it this way, everything has risk, right? The bond market has risk, and that's supposed yeah. to be the, uh, the, the risk-free asset, right? There's risks in the bond market, as people found out. So volat price volatility in itself is not a risk, um, in, in my mind. That, that, that's vol yep. I, I, I define okay. it differently. So put it this way. Do you think that Bitcoin has more or less risk right now than equities, like an ETF, the S&P 500? I think personally, I think it has less risk. Okay, and I, and I agree with you, just for the record, one hundred percent. And I want to explore why for the audience. Why do you think it has more or less risk? I think it has less risk because you know, personally, from my vantage point, I think I have a good understanding of what the asset is, and I think oh, most of the world is not allocated to it, and I think it is becoming painfully obvious that they need to be, and I think it's there's a high probability that they're going to be. Additionally, there's not operators in the same way that there are with equities and some of the same risks, right, that involve, uh, you know, profit and loss and revenue and all the differences that, you know, involve you know, all the different factors that you value a company based on. So it's just a totally different asset. And I think that also, I mean, just, you know, I'm not a big, like, draw lines on a chart guy, but, you know, when you look at something that has no... Uh, like you know no circuit breakers when volatility is high no you know buyer of last resort like the fed to just sort of step in it's shown to be extremely resilient and you know march back in you know somewhat of a tight monetary uh, environment um and regained all-time highs and so i think like just the totality of all these different factors and more are reasons to you know view it as something that has low risk with you know with relatively high upside over the short to midterm when you compare it with something like equities, but there's maybe a better way to articulate that, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you mean by equities, right? Because there are equities that have been flat for 20 years. See the Nikkei, right? Like there's, there's, there's international equities that have not moved and we're colored by the U.S. stock market, most importantly, the S&P 500. But, you know, there's a lot of portions of the stock market that have been flat for quite a long period of time, right? So price appreciation, price decline, I don't really view those as, as pure risks. I put them more in the bucket of volatility of the asset. Um, to me, like, I think the risk are things like, you know, structural issues. You know, in, in Bitcoin, you point out, like, there are technical structural issues that uh, I guess some of us are better than others at explaining and getting into depth. And, you know, I, you hear you hear stuff, everything ranging from quantum computing to, you know, what if there's a political dispute that requires a fork of the chain, these types of things. But those risks exist, right? But uh, to me, like, those risks on a comparative basis, I think you can make arguments that they're not necessarily more risky than equities. They're just different types of risks, and there isn't as much historical precedent on how to deal with them. There's plenty of historical precedent now, decades of historical precedent with with uh, um, with stocks and equities. But I will note, as Fred is well aware of, there is minimal 
historical uh, precedent about ETFs now. We have not had the concentration of ETFs. Even the, the Bloomberg guys will tell you, like, uh, we've never had real mass run for the exit with some of these ETF vehicles and passive investments. Mike Green talks about this all the time. There are idiosyncratic risks that could exist with ETFs um, that we've not even yet fully explored. Um, there's, you know, the, there's, there's things that could come up that are uh, concerning given their favorability and dominance in the marketplace and, and liquidity issues associated with them. So there's always this idiosyncratic risks. I don't think any investment is risk free. And the real question is, what is the how, how are you how are you quantifying the risk? How are you assessing the risk? And to me, I, I actually agree with the premise of Gary's point that I think the the risks in Bitcoin, the biggest risk that most regular investors are going to talk about is generally that you could have a price decline. Um, but unless you believe fundamentally there's something wrong with the asset, uh, that should be of little concern to you, I think, uh, unless you need the money in the short run for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I do think that the, uh, the just the one thing on the ETF wrapper, the, the wrapper at this point is, is a very solid technology, right? The concept of the ETF wrapper and having BlackRock and Fidelity in particular uh, kind of as the lead people behind this ETF, I don't think there's any problem with the ETF wrapper or technology. I think it's, you know, it's it's definitely tried and true and tested. And so, you know, how that interacts with Bitcoin specifically as, as opposed to, you know, selling, selling massive amounts of Bitcoin in a liquidation, sure, you know, that, that's, that's something new. But, uh, you know, we, we basically have ETFs for every other asset class under the sun, so I, I have no problem with ETFs. Hey guys, said this. hey guys, just real quickly, a little housekeeping. If everybody could retweet the space, also any speakers' questions or answers. If you've come up and you're you're done, if you could remove yourself, so there's about twenty people that want to ask questions or make comments. That'd be really helpful to the room. Sir, you can take me down. Yeah, I'll jump down if people need room. Take care. You guys can just jump down yourself. It doesn't require you know me to do it. That that just would be so helpful for the room. Uh, and most certainly retweet the space. I mean, I don't know any other place you can talk about game theory, adoption, how institutions work. This is really, really cool data to be able to come in here and stress test an idea uh, and, and just work it out with a bunch of traders. I think is the most valuable exercises I've ever had in my life were things exactly like this. They usually took place in trading circles. And I forgot how much I missed it, Fred. And Bitcoin. I mean, it just a British. I really, really miss this. Thank you, Gary, for the uh, housekeeping. Thanks a lot, Gary. So to take it back to the ETF conversation, so Swan had a space this morning that I hopped into for a little bit, and I made the case that for the vast majority of people right now, especially the wealthy people in America, the ETF makes a lot more sense. And I used the the story of, you know, my mom is not going to buy Bitcoin and put it on a hardware wallet. And the Swan guys and a lot of people in that space, I mean, it's like I was heretical. I mean, they wanted to, to crucify me for that statement. But I think, you know, I am pro ETF. And I think generally, as the wealth moves to younger generations, they're going to want to store it and take self custody and put it on a hardware wallet. But right now, where the money is, the ETF is is probably the best option. Yeah, listen, I'm pro the uh, Swan guys, and I'm a you know I, I consider myself an old friend of Corey's, but um, you know at the same time, you know it really is for somebody new getting into this thing. Uh, I would say, you know, the ETF's your first first thing. You know, that's your first stop right now. You know, whether you decide to go into self custody later, listen, I'm I'm super in favor of self custody, and I think you if you own Bitcoin, you own. You owe you owe it to yourself to do self custody and to try out everything connected with Bitcoin, you know, including Lightning, including other things, right? I would even throw in ordinals in that picture, but you know, like just everything connected with Bitcoin, you should learn, right? Everything, and uh, but you know, right now that's not needed, right? The most important thing is just to get exposure to the asset, and you know, thank goodness to uh, you know uh, uh, Gary. Um, uh, Gensler for passing this ETF because he just made it a lot easier for everybody. I'm glad you said that, Fred. I, I know, like, uh, you know, you and British and some others, right? You guys have been talking a lot about the ETFs, and I think there's, like, you know, clearly obvious 
uh, trade-offs, but benefits depending on how you weigh those trade-offs for people, especially, you know, newer entrants into the market. But I think there's definitely been an attitude by some to kind of, to kind of trash like the idea of self-custody, which it's like, without that, we don't really have a thing going on here. Like it, it's essential. Um, you know, I think with that being said, I think the Trezor CEO is saying that only like two to 3% of people I think are actually doing self-custody. So you know, definitely very much a minority percentage. I'd be keen to know if anybody knows the numbers, like what percentage of coins are self-custody versus, um, you know, held by a custodian. If there's like a way to tell, like with any reasonable accuracy, but I appreciate you making that point, Fred, for sure. Hey, Macro, Ben, Peter, you guys are all adults. Y'all just pop in as you come in. I think we can do the honor system. Is that the way you are, Fred? Sounds good. Thanks, Gary. And uh, Fred, nice to meet you first time in your space. Um, I guess the issue for me becomes... For somebody who's between like a 50k to 100k entry point, like why would you suggest them to enter with Bitcoin as opposed to uh, an alt or meme coin where they could see a 50 to 100x very quickly? Um, as opposed, I mean, to- we can't, we can't, we can't let shitcoiners take the stage in the in this space. I mean, because it's a shitcoin. Mm-hmm. Because you can lose your entire fifty to one hundred k when you go to sleep. <laughs> See, this, gets, this gets back to my comment, Dallas. I just about- removed them from speakers because we can't have people su- suggesting going into alts to make fifty x. He can listen, but he can't speak. Dallas, this gets back to my. Yeah, that's going to be. Just hang tight one second, guys. This gets back to I think I'm the one that said it has zero risk, and what I sh- Bitcoin has zero risk. It has zero risk relative to all my other options. And that's why you're so heavily allocated. Um, I mean, I think the U.S. dollar, I can most certainly say, whether it's in my lifetime or not, it will fail at some point. Catastrophically, it it will kill people. The failure, well, it's already doing it, but like it'll be be written about history one day that the U.S. dollar collapsed. And to deny that, would be to deny 7,000 years of history and to suggest that we're such a great country that we can stop 7,000 years of fiat Ponzi schemes always having to pull the curtain and let's start a new theater, right? And that's just what happens. It's just the Bankruptcy Act. So to me, if I'm 30 years old, and I'm only making 70 grand a year, but I'm living in a house. Seriously, I actually start looking at, hey, I need to get out of this house. And I can, like, I think the great tragedy is going to be the amount of Bitcoiners here that have been here for eight years. And they are getting ready to spend money on a house. And that's just the stupidest play in the world right now. Like, I'm getting these phone calls now. Hey, what would you do with a million bucks? You know, I'm like, dude, I'd put it in Bitcoin and rent. And, like, it's the families that don't understand this. So, like, I'd be really happy with any of these really smart Wall Street guys to hold a little seminar one day on what it really costs to own a home. And any time you bought it relative to Bitcoin, it's a really staggering thing to wake the family up because there are options. I don't want to hear this. Hey, I only make 70 grand and I'll never, ever own a Bitcoin. I just don't think that's true, guys, if you go out and hustle. Yeah, and if I could just piggyback on that, because that's what um, my original point was basically about, right, was you have the median person who's under 35 has 14K as their net worth, right? And the tragedy here that I see is I, I'm as bullish as anyone, okay? I, I absolutely believe that anybody and everybody who can should be buying. That's what I do. I sold my house for this in 2020. So, like, that's where I'm at right now. But The thing is, if we are completely forgetting that the median person out there is not going to be able to basically protect themselves from what is potentially coming that Gary is talking about, and I think forgetting about that could put you in a situation either um, in person with people that is potentially difficult and or could be even threatening to your own personal well-being if because you have to just look at the history of of um currency transitions right it's 
the last six times over the last 600 years has been violent in some way. It's been war of some kind. And to think that nothing like that could be around the corner, I think, would be naive. And so my only point is at least be considering or thinking about that median person who probably isn't going to be in as good of a position as people who have been around here for a while. And um, I just think it's good for perspective to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, while we are all bullish and celebrating, and, and I'm right there with everybody, you know, I have I was making Creed memes too, okay? so <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of with so. Gary on this one, though. I mean, I think, you know, the medium person, I think that people just waste a lot of money. I mean, there's a dude I work with, he goes to Disney World like five times a year. So I think that, like, there is people who could, like, dig significantly deeper and get to a whole coin if they just stopped wasting their money on fucking garbage. Uh, but, you know, voice of one. <laughs> 